tuning in online. It is always such a, a joy and an honor to come together as a body of Christ on a Sunday morning and sing of what the Lord has done. And maybe this morning you have a little less joy than last Sunday, but 
when we get our joy from the Lord, that is what motivates, that's what, that's what grows us, and that is where our strength comes from. Psalms 34 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. So this morning as a body of Christ, let's magnify the Lord. Let's make ourselves smaller and him more well known. Jesus, we put our focus and our eyes on you this morning. We set aside any distraction and we worship you, almighty God, in your name. Amen. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry And then from north to south And east to west We'd hear cries be
And when you wipe these tears away, I'll cry worthy Above every other name, you are worthy I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise I'll never stop singing your praise
culture that we have created of, of busyness and productivity. It's really easy to be, get really caught up in living the Christian walk, walking the Christian walk, and not spending time with the one who it's all about. So then it's really easy for our expectations to be up here and our productivity level to be down here because we've lost connection with the source of our strength and the source of our hope. This song, every time we sing it, do you, can you make that your prayer? Then nothing else will do. I'm caught up in this moment. Jesus, I just wanna sit at your feet. Father, I pray that that would be a priority in our hearts. It, the priority wouldn't be doing the work of the church. The priority would be sitting at the feet of the King of Kings who created the church. Jesus, we want to know you. We can't go deeper if we don't spend the time with you. I'm caught up in this moment and I just want to sit at your feet. I'm sorry that I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry that I've just gone through the motions when it is all about you. Can we have
have the, the lyrics to that second verse. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I've just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. Come on, sing that out to him this morning. Let that be our prayer, not just today, but every day throughout this week, that we would go back to where it started, to you, Father. You are so good, and we worship you, mighty God, in your name. Amen. Can you give him praise this morning, church, as you sit down? Hey church, I'm Pastor Steve, that's stupid. Yeah. Pastor Steve here, I like that, that was better. Hello, hello, hello. I was trying to help, but Eric needed to talk to me. Our midweek services resume on Wednesday, September 13th at 6.30 p.m. And there's something for everybody, from adult youth group Wow. <laughs> okay, take two. It's <laughs> killing me, bro. Hold on, let me get my mind right. Why are you, why are you looking at me like that, John? Huh? And then I look, and then I say something, and you turn away. Why are you scoping me out like that? We want to invite you to our midweek service, Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. We have something for everyone. We hope to see you there. Was that? That felt empty. So, what did I say? John, why, bro? I see you, man. <laughs> Come on, I have an interview with the press in 30 minutes. I have to get out of here. Come on, guys, hurry up. Press, very important man. Hello there, it is September, and that means prayer is starting again Tuesday mornings. So please, good morning. I don't want to say good morning because you might use this later in some other thing. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. It's September, and that means we resume prayer Tuesday mornings at 7 o'clock. We'd love for you to be there. We start September 12th from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Please join us for morning prayer. No good. Singing in the rain, so. Mm. Our Thanksgiving outreach is back, Boxes of Love, where we help families in need have a full Thanksgiving meal in their homes. So, what are, do we do? We grab a box that is in the foyer. Nope, scrap it, I didn't like it. Bring it back to the church, and we'll provide the turkey, and then we'll deliver these boxes on the Monday before Thanksgiving. Our Thanksgiving outreach is back, Boxes of Love, where we provide a full Thanksgiving meal for families in need. All right. We're so glad you came to visit us. We're so glad you're here at Bethel this Welcome, we're so glad that you are here today. Card. Please fill that out with as much or as little information as you feel comfortable with. If you're a first time guest, if you're... 
I said guest. Guest. Instead of visitor, I said guest. I, I, I'm supposed to say guest. Never mind. I'm going to start again. Our first time guest with us today, please stop by at the welcome desk on the way out. We have a gift we'd like to give you. God bless you and have a great day. Why? You couldn't have told me the last three times? Okay. <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, yes. Yes. Hi, church. This is Pastor Eric here. And we are so glad to announce our next spiritual boot camp. Saturday, 13th of January, we are going to do it. And it's going to be in our church office, 3669 Gilderland Avenue at 10 a.m. So if you want to grow in your face, in your face, ah, if you want, wait, 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 yeah, don't distract me. I'm not going to squat. Yeah, I'm not going to do that the whole time. I agree. Here to grow in our faith, faith, faith <laughs> in our faith. Thank you, Pastor Eric, for putting that together. That's the real reason there weren't more of him, because he did it. So uh, that was fun, and that helps, uh, that helps introduce our topic a little bit this morning. But before we get there, for our first-time guests, thank you for joining us. We have a lovely gift for you out at the welcome desk. <laughs> Go ahead and stop by. And remember, there's plenty of ways to give. You can give in person, buckets in the back, online, mail a check, whatever works. But whatever you say can and will be used against you in a future video. So we got that working for us. So we started with bloopers, and this is perfect for what I want to talk about this morning. Uh, if you missed last Sunday, and a lot of you did, the weather was terrible, but we were here and we, we put it online. I, I, I kind of do this every week, but I really want you to catch last week's message because I feel like it's foundational for what we want going forward this year, what we're doing as a church, where, where we're focused. And then this week kind of builds on the tail end of last week. So please check that out. I want our whole church family to kind of hear that, be on the same page. So from video bloopers to real life bloopers, like real life making mistakes, we messed up. Uh, this is common to the human experience. All right, we don't need a video camera rolling to know that we make mistakes, that we do things wrong, that from time to time we mess some things up. So this morning, my sermon builds on this. And the title of my sermon, very loving, very mm, warm, is You're Doing It Wrong. <laughs> You're Doing It Wrong. Ten Mistakes Christians Make at Church. Ten mistakes, one for each toe that I'll be stepping on. So that's perfect. Ten mistakes that Christians make at church, a sermon guaranteed to offend you or your money back. Just kidding, we won't give you your money back, but you will be uh, challenged. You'll be challenged. I think it's important this morning, if you know me, this is easier. If you don't, you have to take my word for it. I want you to hear the heart of what I'm sharing today because this is for you. We, we shared last week, we want to have our best year ever. And if we do that spiritually, God takes care of the other stuff. So part of doing our best ever is not just the things we spoke about last week, things we have to do, there's some things we have to undo. We have to fix some mistakes. So it's, it's football season, it's playoff season, unless you're Giants fans, then it's golf season. That's cool, that's all right. We're not here to judge. Uh, 
and every team this week was popping in tape and they were watching previous games and they were looking for what they did poorly and what they can do, playoff week, what they can do to correct it and get it right. That is such a great mindset for our walk with Christ, where we get into the word of God, we look at it, we read it, we study it, and we use it to teach and rebuke and correct and train in righteousness, the Bible teaches us. We learn what's right, what's not right, how to make it right, how to keep it right. That, that's what this faith journey is. So we don't have any video for you today any more than we've already shown, but the heart here is things that you can do that are gonna help you in your faith. They're gonna help you to grow. They're gonna bless your marriage. They're gonna bless your family. It's gonna bless your future. It's gonna trickle down to your children. This is important. This isn't just for the church. The church will be better if you give more money. That's not it. This is, if we do better at these things, your faith is better, your family is stronger, and if your faith and family are stronger, guess what? Your church is stronger. So this is all connected for us, all right? So if you feel yelled at and scolded this morning, I'm okay with that, that's cool. Uh, but understand the heart. The heart is, let's get it right and honor God with everything we do. Let's get it right so we can honor him with everything that we do. We know that the church is not a social club. We are not here for status. You are not rubbing elbows with celebrities. I will not sign prayer cloths and send them home with you. All right. We are not doing that. We're not about that. We know that church is not the secret ingredient for you to get to heaven. All right. Churches preach that whole doctrinal statements. If you're not a part of this church, you can't go to heaven. No, stop. All right. We know it's Jesus, faith alone through grace alone. No question about that. We also know, or maybe you don't, the church is not responsible for your spiritual growth. You are. We're here to help. The church is not responsible for your kids' spiritual growth. If your kid's a screw-up, it's not our fault. You did that. We're just trying to help. We understand that we are personally responsible for our relationship with Christ. We know that going to church is not a substitute for daily living for Jesus. Let me say it again for the people in the back. Going to church is not a substitute for daily living for Jesus. Sometimes we deceive ourselves a little. Oh, I'm pretty good. I go to church. All right. Church is more than that. What's the church supposed to be? The Greek word is ekklesia. It means the called out ones that God has called us out of the world, out of darkness into his glorious light. He's called us out of the world and he's called us to what? Well, there's three purposes of the church, and this isn't my sermon this morning, uh, but I've, I've shared this before, the three purposes of the church. One, to worship God. Worshiping God is not singing. Worshiping God is being obedient to him and living for him and making decisions that honor him all week. Singing for a half hour is one expression of vocal worship, but our worship to God is obedience all week, living for him. One purpose of the church is to worship God together as saints. Second purpose for the church is for the equipping of the saints, Ephesians tells us, that you would be equipped to live the life that Jesus wants you to live. You learn some of that here. You learn that in the church. You have to apply it. It's not enough to just hear it. You have to do it. Talked about that last week. But that's the second purpose, equipping the saints. And the third one is for the evangelization of the entire world. The third one is whether it's 500 feet down our driveway or 5,000 miles across the globe that people are hearing about Jesus 
and they're hearing about him through you. They're hearing about him through your testimony and your witness. They're hearing about him through our church. They're hearing about him through the ministries of our church, through the missions support that we give and, and the others that we enable to go out and share the gospel. That is a primary purpose of the church. So three things that we're called out and called to. We're called to worshiping God. We're called to equipping the saints, growing in our faith. We're called to evangelization. With that in mind, let me give you a verse. Philippians 3.17. Paul talks about this and how to do it. And he says something pretty bold. He says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Paul says by following the scripture and following his example, we have the right way to do it. Today, I would challenge you to follow the example of the spiritual leaders in your life. They, they are showing you the right way. We're not perfect by a long shot, but we're showing you the right way. Why? So that you could have your best year in Christ ever. And your best year in Christ, newsflash, is going to be the best year in your marriage, the best year in your family. It's going to be the best year in your job. It's going to bring you hope. It's going to bring you peace. It's going to bring you stability in life storms. Now, if none of those things interest you, eh, play on your phone for the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes. But for the rest of us, this is what we want. When we put first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Jesus says we don't have to worry about the other stuff when we put him first. So some tips today on how we're going to put this first. Look at that verse again. One second. Actually, don't look at the verse. Look at the graphic behind the verse. This is great. Look at the dude. He's sitting in the fourth. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I went online, we, we subscribe to a, like a national database of graphic design, probably international, where we just grab stuff all the time. And they actually had this already made, titled, You're Doing It Wrong. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this was a thing? That scares me, because that means other Church, like this is a thing. Like there's a lot of stuff we're doing wrong we need to address so much so that there's a graphic we could use for it. No changes made to the graphic. Somebody left first service today and said, I don't even own plaid. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> Solid. True story. I was a youth pastor for 10 years before I came to Bethel. Some of you know that. Terrifying. Terrifying on so many levels. Uh, I worked with, with your teenagers. Whew. And... And we had a youth Sunday, and for youth Sunday, the pastor gave me the pulpit to preach, and we had the youth worship team to do worship. And we were young, and we're cool. We're not like those old people like I am now. And, and we were going to be louder, and we were going to do cool songs, not the lame songs the church does. And we're just going to get into it and do our thing. So we were up there, and we had a pretty good team, and, and they were singing and playing and doing their whole thing and everything else. And right on my left about four rows back on the aisle was an old man. That was the face. That was totally the face, but he went further. He sat in his seat as we're all standing and worshiping and giving me that dirty glare look, he was like this. <laughs> not even subtle, not like, oh, it's a little loud. No, 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 full scowl. And if I had a picture of that, we would have a different graphic for today. <laughs> but this idea that doing it wrong is the business of some grumpy old men, I want you to know, the seniors in this church are pretty delightful. It's you 40 and 50 year olds that are cranky. I'm not gonna lie, all right? Our seniors are, have been great. They've been supportive. They're faithful. They're, there's, I mean, there's a few that might you know, be a little cranky, but this isn't, this isn't specific to like an old grumpy white male. Th this is more than that. This is looking at some, some beliefs or maybe habits or some patterns that we've fallen into and we might not even realize it, but it's hurting our faith. And I want your faith to be awesome. I don't want it to struggle. So with that, I bring you 10 mistakes Christians 
make it, church. Who should we offend first? I'll start over here. Okay, so number one, we're going to have fun today. I'll make you laugh, but only to cover up the awkward silence, okay? We'll, we'll hit some stuff as we go through it. Number one, let's talk about inconsistency. And I am talking about church. I'm talking about coming out to the fellowship, to the gathering of the saints. Hebrews tells us, don't forsake assembling yourselves together. Inconsistency at church, church services, and church activities will hurt your personal growth. It will hurt your faith. If you go to the gym seven days a week, or you go to the gym one day a week, which one is more beneficial for you? Okay, in the same way, if we're in church regularly and making it a part of our habit and routine and pattern, we will grow more and we will do better and we will get closer to Jesus than those who do not. This is pretty simple. Now it's winter in upstate New York and we've dodged the snow for the most part until now. Western New York, not so much. They canceled a Bills game. That's how, the 65 mile per hour wind gust. It wasn't even the snow, it was the blowing snow. You can't see or drive, okay? We wouldn't be able to pass the ball. The Steelers, they can't pass anyway. So that doesn't hurt them. Um, but anyway, the game gets pushed. The city is shut down. You cannot drive in Western New York because it's really bad. Now I grew up driving in the snow. I feel like I'm an excellent driver in the snow. My passengers may have different opinions <laughs> and it's a free country, they're entitled to those, but I'm very comfortable, I feel like we're doing great. Like, but you're sliding, but it's a controlled slide. <laughs> so steer into it, <laughs> okay? So I, I have this, this picture and I think it applies really good here. If you've grown up in this kind of weather, at some point, your car has been stuck in the snow. Somewhere along the line, you, you were in a snowbank, you bottomed out, you, your tires were, and you're hitting the, and it's just spinning. Spinning and spinning and spinning. And upstate New York, you know the tricks. You got the shovel in the back or you're digging it out with the top of your snow brush, trying to get some traction. Maybe you got salt in your car. You did the, the car mat trick. You put the, the floor mat under the tire. It gives it some traction, pulls you out real quick. All right, all the little tricks we learned being upstate New Yorkers. When you are inconsistent in your attendance at church, you are like the car snuck on the snowbank. The wheels are turning, but you're not going anywhere. It's, you're busy. There's a lot happening. It's just not producing what you want it to. I think that is a great analogy of what happens when we're inconsistent with you. And this isn't like, we need more people at church, so I'm going to preach on inconsistency. No, we have too many people at church. We need a third service or another plague. I don't know. All right. <laughs> third service is a lot of work. Plague thins it out. So we'll see. We'll see what God wants to do. This is not about getting butts in seats. Don't care about that. This is about, I want your faith to grow. I want you to go deeper with Jesus. I want you to experience everything he has for you. And it's not going to happen once a month or, or twice a month or every major holiday. It's going to happen when you commit yourself to being in God's house. This is for you to help you, to help you grow. First one, inconsistency. Number two, number three, kind of, kind of attached to number one here. Number two is you don't get involved, and number three, you don't get invested. Time is an investment. For most people here, you would say time is your most valuable resource, more so than money. Investing your time, investing your energy, and yes, investing financially in your church are all important things. And here's the issue. When you're invested, you handle things differently than when you're not. If you come into church because you like the music, or you come to church because the pastor's funny, I come to church because uh, my friends are there, that's great. But if you're not involved and you're not invested, a lot doesn't need to happen for you to ditch this show and go to the other show in town. 
You'll just bounce wherever you're entertained. When you're involved, when you're serving, when you're committing your time, when you're committing your finances, when you want to be a part of what the church is all about, not just popping in to pop in and say, oh, I went to church, I'm a good person. There is a different level of commitment from those who are involved and invested. And guess what? Those who are committed to that are growing more in their faith. And this is about you growing in your faith. And the excuses are, amazing. People are like, oh, but I'm so busy. That is so insulting to everyone who's committed, who's also insanely busy. But they make time for what's important because they know it helps them in their faith. It helps them to grow with Jesus. Get rid of the excuses and prioritize these things for your faith so you can grow. There's something about being invested. There's something of a difference, and I've shared this in the past, between the mindset of an owner and the mindset of an employee. The owner is invested. He cares about the outcome. The employee is there from seven to three, and then I'm done, and I don't care. And when when we just come to church and we're in and out and we're not connected, we're not invested, we're not involved, we're just kind of there for us and we do our thing and we leave, we're like the, the, the employee who's just punching a clock. When we're invested, there's a deeper level of care. For those of you who are in business or you own a small business or your name is on the business, you know the difference in the level of care when someone's invested versus, oh yeah, they, they work here. Or, oh yeah, they go here. And somebody, oh yeah, I go to Bethel. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> They're not ours. (laughs) There's a difference when you're invested. And you're invested when you're serving, when you're getting involved, when you're giving, when you're pursuing what we're pursuing, and when when the, the mission of the church becomes something you're personally a part of. That's the level where you grow the most. And if you're growing the most, why wouldn't you be there? Why wouldn't you be doing that? That's what God wants for our life. Not so the church is better, bigger, has more money. We're going to have our business meeting in another month, and I'm going to get up and do what I've done every year. Best year ever, most attendance ever, best giving ever, most missions giving ever. It just gets old, doesn't it? Isn't that just terrible? God blesses this church. We do great. This isn't coming, and now a new building program. No, 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 no. This is for you to grow. This is for you to get it. I'm not bringing this to you in a time of crisis or problems or like, oh, the pastor, pastoral staff, we got together this week. We made a list of things we're super angry about. We call it our own pastoral festivus, the airing of grievances. For you Seinfeld fans, yes, okay. Where we're just gonna get together and we're gonna complain. That's not it. This is all about our best year ever. Your faith growing in leaps and bounds in 2024 like never before. If we're going to do that, we're going to have to watch the tape and we're going to have to make some changes. We're going to have to tweak some things. Getting involved, getting invested, inconsistency. First three, number four. Oh boy. Number four, lateness. Ooh, mm, ouch. Step on those toes. Woo. All right. All right, now hear me out. First of all, I didn't want to share this one. Pastor Eric said I should. (laughs) So anything you don't like about this, talk to him. Let's talk about lateness in a spiritual context. All right? Coming in late sends the wrong message. Coming in late with the Starbucks cup really sends the wrong message. But that, okay, okay. What's the message that it's sending? This is a message about how important this gathering is to you. And even if that's not how you feel, it's the message you're sending to others. So for the brand new believer who watches you walk in late, 
their thought is, well, this must not be that important to them. For the first time guest who watches you walk in late, same thought. For your children. We'll get there when we get there. And maybe the attitude is, they should just be happy I'm there. Well, about that. We're thrilled that you're here, but you don't know me that well, do you? Uh, what's the message that we're sending? Don't say busy, like no one else here is busy. That's not great. And let me just throw this out to you, just because I love you. Do you feel the love today? There's a lot of love, right? A lot of love. Go ahead, get that. I'll wait. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Number 11, okay, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, bring it back, bring it back. That was a good, good comedic break. I planted that cell phone to do that, to break up the awkwardness of all you late people. You can only blame the train so many times, right? I've been here for 20 years. I know the train schedule. It's not always the train. <laughs> Some of you, I'm questioning your train scheduling accuracy because I don't think we can blame that county line. The old building, the first building we were in, we could see the train, we could hear the train, and you can feel it when it goes over if you're in the offices. Okay, here we're a little further away. But no excuses. What is the message that we send? And I think that message is important. And just for fun, and I'm giving you a warning because I love you. A lot of love here. Nothing but love. <laughs> you come in late. We're three songs into worship. The lights are out. The haze is starting to dissipate. Everyone's standing. Nobody sees that you come in late. You find your seat. You fit in. By the time we start, boom, it's full. Everybody's been here the whole time, clearly. Just having a wonderful time worshiping Jesus with our whole church, just like Easter. We're all just here early. It's wonderful. But be warned. A couple times this year, I'm going to flip the order of service. We're going to do one song, and I'm going to start preaching. And you're going to walk in on point number six. <laughs> and all the lights are going to be on. <laughs> and everyone's gonna be seated, and there's no seats in the back because they fill up first, and you're gonna wander right up here and sit down, and I'm gonna stop, and I'm gonna wait for you. I'll be like, <laughs> judging the whole time. So listen, you've been warned when we flip the service order, don't say I didn't warn you. Think about, seriously, think about the message that we're sending about importance, and I think that's valuable. Number five, let's get a little bit more serious here. Number five, putting your pastor on a pedestal. Putting your minister in this highly, holy, exalted, oh, they can do no wrong, because what will happen is eventually they will do wrong and you're, you're, you're just destroyed, you're wrecked. This is a dangerous thing. I'm not a big fan of heights as it is, so be careful on this one. Putting the men of God, the leaders, the pastors in your life on this great spiritual pedestal that they can do no wrong. That actually comes from some really bad teaching from Catholicism with the Pope and he's perfect and that, that's kind of a carryover a little bit and we know that's not the case. Humans mess up. Pastors are humans. So just be prepared for that. Revelation 22.8. John is writing the book of Revelations. He's seeing all these amazing visions and he's putting them down and he sees this one vision and it so moves him. In Revelation 22, he falls down and he starts worshiping the angel who gave him the vision, who showed him these things. And the angel says, dude, get up. We're like, what are you doing? He goes, I'm a servant just like you worship God. I would say the same thing to you this morning. Keep your eyes on Jesus. People will fail you. Pastors will fail you. Some of you are here today because a previous pastor failed you. People will always fail you. Jesus will never fail you. 
I don't know how long you've been coming to the church, but give me enough time and I will annoy you. I will offend you. I will say something sarcastic that I think is hilarious and you will hate me for it or at least be really angry. I will do something that bugs you. I will fail to do something that bugs you. Pastors are humans. We'll make mistakes. I can't preemptively apologize for all of them in advance because that doesn't seem sincere. But when it happens, we'll deal with it properly then. Keep your faith in Jesus, not people. You, you probably know someone today whose faith was shipwrecked because a leader hurt them or a leader had a failure or a leader f fell from grace or whatever. You probably know people whose faith was hurt because a leader messed up. Don't put your faith in leaders. Put your faith in Jesus. Keep your faith in Jesus. And for those leaders in the past that have hurt you, that doesn't mean that God wasn't using them in your life for a season. That doesn't mean that every word they ever spoke to you, oh, it must be from the devil because they're such an awful person. Okay, relax, breathe. God uses people that are flawed all the time. God uses flawed people at this church every day, and especially on Sunday mornings. Keep your faith in Jesus, not people. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not people. People fail. Jesus never will. Number six. Number six, it wouldn't be a complete list if we didn't talk about spiritual gifts. So let's talk about the gift of criticism. That's not on the list, is it, Linda? I don't think that is, actually. The gift of criticism. Just sitting back complaining about everything. So if I go to a movie and the movie's terrible, who goes to movies anymore? How old are you, pastor? If you rent a movie or stream a movie and it's terrible, you're like, oh, what a waste of money. I shouldn't even paid for that. It was terrible. We, we critique the movie. Are you old enough to remember Siskel and Ebert? You're like, thumbs down. Two thumbs down, it was terrible. So you're not. You're not old enough to remember them. See, I told you that was a bad reference, John Gentile. They're too young. All right. So you go to a restaurant, and the service is terrible, and the food is cold. I'm going to complain. I'm spending my good money. That food's awful unless my daughter works there. Then I just ignore it. It's cool. We'll let it go today. Um, <laughs> When we have a service mindset where we're going to go in and pay something, we're going to be served, you're going to hear my feedback. If I don't know, I'm going to go on Yelp and I'm going to tell people that you're terrible and that your sub sandwiches were awful. Or That's the consumer mindset. If you bring that into church, you're doing it wrong. There is a place for constructive criticism. We welcome constructive criticism. We welcome people who have some, some problems that they've seen and maybe they suggest, I don't know, a solution, <laughs> something to help it out. And I'll tell you this, I've been here for 20 something years. I know 99.9% .9 of the problems here. I know them because I probably caused them I've been here a long time. I can't pass the, oh, the last pastor really messed things up. That was 1990. Oh, yeah. I get it. And when someone comes with a heartfelt concern and they give us something where we could make something better, we love that. Like, that, that is helpful. We don't have a ton of complainers in this church. I'm, I'm very thankful for that. But to think that we just get to sit back like movie critics or food critics and uh, the sermon was good, but it was a little, the temperature was a little cold. My seat personally could use some fluffing. It was a little uncomfortable. Um, I found the volume to be adequate for the message, but worship was a little loud except the violin. I couldn't hear enough of that. Stop it. This is not a movie review. This is a place for us to connect with Jesus and connect with our church family. Imagine going home and your mom makes dinner and you're like, mom, it was good, but listen, the food was a little cold. I don't like where I sat. I thought I should have been on the other. She's gonna hit you with the wooden spoon. Italians, you had that, right? <laughs> you remember what that is. Leave your spirit of criticism at the diner. Come here to worship God 
And if you've got some good ideas how we could make something better, we would love to hear it. We would love to hear it because guess what? We want to make it better too. Crazy. Will our styles always agree? No. Will we find good common ground where we can worship God together? Clearly we have. Keep the critical spirit at home. Let's bring a humble spirit to God and grow in him. Number seven. Number seven, you're missing the best part. You're missing the fellowship. One of the greatest things, I've said this a lot lately. One of the greatest things in the family of God is the family of God. Getting connected with other people, getting to know people. This is what makes us stronger in the faith. What's stronger, you in your faith alone or you with a bunch of people around you? Do you serve God better when you're all by yourself or when you're surrounded by other Christians? Does your marriage do better when it's you and your wife against the world? And it feels that way sometimes, doesn't it? Or when it's you and your, your wife or you and your husband and a community of believers around you, lifting you up, pouring into you, you pouring into others. Scripture gives us a layout for this, talks about this, talks about the older men pouring into the younger men, the older ladies pouring into the younger ladies, all of us submitting to one another and working together, not just hanging out with the four people that we like. You need to like more people, work on that. Not just talking with people who share the same last name as us, okay? It's your family for crying out loud. You'll see them when you go home, stop it. <laughs> but really connecting with one another. Let me throw this out to you because this really speaks to the fellowship. Jesus said, by this will everyone know you belong to me by how you love each other by how we in the church treat each other. Last week's message, we were talking about the fellowship a little bit. They actually cared about each other. Like, that's a good thing. So let's use this as a litmus test. When was the last time you invited someone from the church over just to share a meal or for coffee? Not a family member. Aha, you're like, I did not, family member. Eh, they're out. That's how we build this. That's how we become the kind of place where unbelievers see it and they say, those people really love each other. And it's that love along with the risen Savior and the power of the Holy Spirit that made the early church explode in growth. Oh, how they loved each other. And that should be the testimony of the church. We're not going to get that if we're the last ones in and we're the first ones out and we're not involved and we're not serving and we're just in and out just to get our Jesus time and check the box on our calendar, we find that when we really begin to get connected with one another. Why is that important? Because you'll grow as a believer, because iron sharpens iron. So you'll grow as a believer and you will be a better believer in a community of fellowship than you are out on your own. This is for you. This is for you to grow. Missing the best part, fellowship. Number eight. Number eight, two more to go. How's my time? I'm good. We're golden. Beautiful. Number eight. Not, not trying to split hairs here, but hear me out. Winning people to church instead of winning people to Jesus. I am pro. I am in favor of you inviting people to church. I want to be abundantly clear on that fact. If you are inviting people to church, thank you and continue to do so because we talk about Jesus here. He's the reason for all of it. Th that's good. However, don't sell people on a church experience. Don't just tell them about Bethel. Tell them about Jesus. Bethel doesn't save anybody. Jesus does. Don't just tell them what a great church you have or it's not as bad as the last one. I don't know how you phrase that, actually. But anyway, don't just tell them about your church. Tell them about your Savior and what he's done in your life. I'm not saying don't invite people. I want you to invite people, absolutely. But more than that, don't just invite them to church. Invite them to a relationship with Christ. Tell them what your Jesus has done in your life. That's what people need. They need to know that there's hope. The church is not the hope of the world. 
Jesus's. Jesus's. So yes, keep inviting him. Pro inviting. I want to make that really clear. But don't just invite him to church. Tell him about your Lord and your Savior. Number nine. Number nine mistake that Christians make. Expecting more from others than you do of yourself. This one is bad. Oh, we expect others to reach out to us, but we don't reach out to anybody. Uh-oh. We expect others to, to be caring and show concern, but we never show concern for anyone else. Like we're just kind of in our own world. We expect others to be friendly to us, but we're not friendly people. You might actually be cranky. You, you might be unfriendly. You're, you're not even like neutral. You, like, you look angry to be here and you're complaining that people aren't friendly. I'm like, well, that's because they're scared of you. So <laughs> there's that. I, I know I got that face. I get that all the time. I hear you. Being, being the person we expect other people to be, oh, that is dangerously close to being a hypocrite expecting other people to change, but we don't change. This one gets me, because I've heard this one. I've heard it, and maybe some of you thought it. Pastor, that was such a good word Sunday. I can't believe more people weren't at the altar, he said. Well, he was not at the altar. <laughs> like, I really expected people to respond to that message. That was really solid, he said, from the fourth row from the back. Dude, you want to see people at the altar? Come to the altar! <laughs> Set an example. Listen, we don't have awkward altar calls, all right? We're not like, so right now we just want to pray for like child abusers and meth addicts. If we can have the child abusers and meth addicts. No, no, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait. Anybody? Meth beats kids. Anyone? I'm not going up there, I'm a sinner. We don't do that. What's our altar call? If you want to respond to the sermon, if God spoke something to you, and the topic may have been child abuse and meth, but that's not the point. Because we always add on. Or if you just want to press into God, or if you're going through something and you need prayer. So here's a quick lesson for you from the Old Testament. The idea of the altar comes from the Old Testament. All right? And it was a place where they would bring sacrifices to worship God. And do you know who brought the sacrifices? Everybody. That's the key. Everybody brought them. Not just the worst sinners. We'll save like right here for the worst sinners. If you're the worst sinner, take this spot so we'll know and we'll pray with you. We'll have a couple of us. Uh, everyone brought their offering. Why? Because everyone understood we're sinners. We need God's blessing and God's favor and we want to seek his face and glorify him. Everyone was going to the altar. That's the mindset. To sit back and question why people aren't at the altar from your seat is really a great illustration of what we're talking about here. We expect more from other people than we do ourselves. Throw out your pride. Throw out the people who judge me, I'm at the altar. Not if we all come, then we'll judge the people who don't. That is 4D chess. You're welcome. Okay, last one. I'll ask Jess if she'd jump up on the keyboard here as we close. We'll do one of those meth addict altar calls. It'll be awesome. <laughs> Number 10. I've talked a lot about meth this morning. Could we edit that out? Number 10, last one. Important one. Um, this one stings a little. I'm not currently stung, but this one, this one has hurt in the past. Leaving a church the wrong way. Leaving the church the wrong way. I'll be personal here because I don't know other pastor stories. I know mine. It bugs me. It hurts a little when someone who I've known well for a number of years, maybe someone I've had meals with, Maybe someone who they've been in my house just up and leaves and doesn't let me know. 
Now, there's two stings there. The first one is, why are you leaving? We have the best church in the world. Duh. Okay, get over that. Second part is, you could have given me a heads up, right? Now, listen, I don't go home and cry about it. We're good. I've been doing this for a long time. We've had hundreds of people that have left the church, and at least four of them have done it well. <laughs> Maybe three. I can't think of a fourth. I can think of three. There's, there's reasons to leave a church. And I know some pastors disagree. They think, oh, grow where you're planted. You're supposed to be there. And then, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like God uses churches and seasons. I think there's seasons of your life where this might be the best church for you, but there could be other seasons where somewhere else might be a better. And I'm not talking winter, fall, spring, like changing churches every three months, <laughs> talking seasons of life. So I don't think once you attend here, you're here for life. I don't have that expectation. Also, God taught me a long time ago, this is not my church and you are not my people. Uh, this is his church and you're his people. So uh, I'm good with all that. But when people leave offended and people leave hurt, and people leave without saying a word and then complain that, oh, no one even called me when I left. Did you tell him you were leaving? No, you did Oh, okay, you just disappeared. All right. That hurts their growth. And I get it. No one likes conflict. All right. A lot of people here today have left other churches. I get that. No one likes the conflict of, hey, let's, you know, Let's talk about why I don't like your church anymore, pastor. <laughs> That's a fun conversation, right? If you like conflict, you're weird and probably need counseling or something, okay? No one likes it. But something godly can happen when there's a good exchange and there's love and there's grace and there's forgiveness. And it's not an hour meeting badgering you into why you need to stay. It's little conversation. I had a guy I knew for 13 years. I was his family's pastor, his whole family. Their pastor for 13 years. That's a long time. He left the church by putting a letter on my desk when I wasn't there and never said a word to me. Just poof, gone. At least I got a letter. I don't know. That's good. That beats angry Facebook post, I guess. <laughs> got those. Uh, that's the wrong way. We're the body of Christ. We are not rival gangs. We are not bloods and crips. <laughs> if you leave this church to go to another one, I'm not going to like shank you in the, in the Stewart's parking lot. All right. <laughs> We're the body of Christ and people are going to be drawn to him by how we love each other we got to do better than that. And I feel like in 20 years, I've never preached a sermon on how to leave a church. And I'm not preaching it today either, but I can't complain about it if I've never told you how to do it. Have a conversation. A letter, anonymously, not great. A text message, a witty meme, no. Have a conversation. Let the iron sharpen iron because you know what's happening and this happens a lot and you know this and you've seen this. Instead of healthy conversations that bring growth, and maybe they bring some change, maybe not. Instead of that, we have a lot of really unhealthy believers who have been to four churches in five years, and they've been offended at every single one of them, but they've never had a good conversation, so they're just sitting home angry and offended. And what's it doing? It's hurting their faith. And that's the heart behind all of this, and I hope you get that this morning. Don't do something that's gonna hurt your faith, do it the right way, do it differently. We recently had a family leave one of our campuses. I'm gonna tell you the right way to do it. And a couple months out, they were sensing that God was leading them in a new direction. They weren't angry. They weren't mad at the pastor. I mean, it was Pastor John. If they were, I'd get it. But there were no issues. There was no drama. They were just sensing in their spirit you know, I think God's shifting something for us. And they told him, they told him well in advance. Last Sunday was their last Sunday or two weeks ago, whatever, was their last Sunday. And they came up front and they prayed over them. They asked God's blessing on them. They sent them out. 
and there's no awkwardness and there's no ducking behind the produce at Price Chopper because you saw your ex-pastor there. There's none of that anymore because it's good and it's healthy and we recognize we're all in the kingdom of God together. There's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way. This is definitely a mistake Christians have made. So let me wrap up with a couple things here. The primary reason, the purpose for this sermon is because you are gonna do better spiritually if you do this stuff right. You're gonna grow more. We're not struggling. We're, we're fine. Bethel's doing really well. Best year ever. But I want you to have your best year ever. I want you to grow like never before. I want you to break old patterns and bad patterns, check the tape, see what's wrong, let's fix it, and let's do even better in 2024. That's the goal. You're hurting your faith. Maybe worse, you're hurting your faith, your families, your children. Maybe still worse, you're deceiving yourself, thinking, no, I'm fine. Let's do better. The healthy mindset when it comes to church and the things of God. A new believer, they would say, all right, God, I'm going Sunday. What do you got for me? That's fair. That's fair. They're just coming to the Lord. They're figuring out what this whole thing's about. And God has something in store for you, something powerful. But that mindset shifts for the mature believer. For the mature believer who has walked with Jesus, you're not walking in here on a Sunday just saying, God, what do you got for me? I hope the coffee's hot. I hope my chair's comfortable. I hope Pastor Steve doesn't freeze us out again. Bring a jacket. In the winter still, and so just bring a jacket just to be safe. The, the mindset's different. For the mature believer, it's God, what do you have for me today? And Lord, what do you have for me to do? Lord, how do you want to use me today? God, how do you want to use me to encourage someone else? How do you want to use me to, to help someone else grow in their faith? Lord, what can you do not just for me? God, what can you do through me at my church today? Different mindset. One is new and it's appropriate. God, what do you have for me? The second is maturity. The second is spiritual growth. God, what would you have me to do? If all you're doing, this is the last thing I'll say, then I'm gonna pray. If all you're doing is attending, you're doing it wrong. And God has way more for you than that. If all you're doing is showing up, and listen, I'm glad you're here, I'm glad you show up. God has so much more for you than that. 2024, best year ever. We're gonna have to get rid of some of the old habits, some of the old ways of thinking, do some things differently, commit it to God, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us. New year, new focus, let's have our best year ever. Would you stand together with me? We're gonna close in prayer. No altar call, I've made it too awkward, I get it, all right, that's fine. I just wanna pray over you today and then we'll, we'll head out. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time we can spend in your house today. And Lord, I know that you are speaking to hearts this morning. Lord, you're speaking to hearts because you want more for us. Father, the problem is you want more for us than we even know we want for ourselves sometimes. And God, there are things in our life and in our thinking and in our habits and patterns, God, that absolutely need to be changed and adjusted, course corrected, Father, so that we can walk more on the path you have for us. Father, I pray for every sincere believer in this room today that they would take some meat from what they heard this morning and that they would be able to apply it to their life so that 2024 will be their best year yet. Because God, we know you're not finished with us. Lord, I pray a blessing on every single believer in this house this morning. Lord, I pray a blessing on every marriage and every family, on every young person in this house this morning. And God, we pray 
for your blessing to be poured out as we seek you, as we honor you. Your word says as we draw near to you, God, you draw near to us and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Father, help us to seek you first in all of our lives. We give you all the praise. We thank you for this church body. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen, forgiveness is an important part of the gospel. So I will be at the door and you will forgive me for whatever I said that was offensive. You will say, great sermon, pastor, and I love you. And then we'll go on our ways. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.